Hello, greetings. Uh, this is the OpenZFS production users call on March 21st. It's literally midnight here and Jan has been talking about UCL for 15 minutes. So uh, the floor is yours, gentlemen. Who has what topic to talk about? Or is okay. anything on the agenda? I've been I've been working on my scripts, but unfortunately, it's mostly, uh, I guess the I guess the new, the the new news for 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 my project is just that I am doing a, uh, I'm doing a talk at BSD Can about it, which will be my first talk anywhere. Um, so hopefully, I can get my get my stuff together and i've uh and yes i do theoretically have a i don't know let's say let's say a 1.0 ish release um but you know with a with a month and a half left to go i i feel like i need to refactor it again a little bit more for human consumption and and sort of decide on you know obviously it's a very opinionated piece of code but i have to decide on um like a, a set of standards and philosophy to really to, to really stick to and make sure that there isn't any um you know make make sure that any any trouble it causes you can it can get out of and by by trouble i mean like you know like i, I definitely want to make it so that you can you can just type four words and safely back up a, a z root without creating overlapping map mounts and and stuff like that. So I have to make decisions about, you know, resetting mount points and whether I unmount or not. Um, mm. You know, there's a cloner built in, uh, and then so so what I'm working on now is 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 making sure that my script is aware of the hierarchy. So so for example, it would it's not going to like set read only on your whole tree. Uh, instead it'll set read only on the top of the tree of the backup of the um of the of the backup to make sure that it doesn't uh you can't accidentally overwrite it um i'm also working on a super and this is something i talked about in a meeting a few weeks ago but there is a way to you can use the fs send receive to perform um to create a clone um now it only works with dash lowercase i so that that causes a little bit of trickiness and it's a little bit it's a little bit fiddly it's it's definitely it definitely looks like it feels like it's a zfs i mean pretty much all of zfs feels like it's designed to be part of a you know a part of an application it, it almost doesn't in, in a lot of ways it doesn't even feel like a you know like a like a personal user tool some of the uh, some of it's so funky, but you, but I do, I do have it working. So if you, if you have discrepancy between, so either you roll back the source, uh, so I'll use the word source and target for, for, a, for a, a production data set and a backup data set. So if your source diverges or your backup diverges, I have alpha code now that will, um, and it's, it's, the command is dash dash rotate. And it will it'll rotate the backup and make sure you don't lose anything. So so it'll you know it'll rename it and then clone it and then replicate the replicate the clone. Mm -hmm. What that means is that you don't have to do a full backup after after a rollback. Um, and then vice versa, it works if you um, if you write data to your target, it'll you can have it rotate the target and then you won't lose anything new in the target. Uh, even though you've uh, you've pulled new backup data onto your um, onto your uh, target data set, it's a little confusing. It would be better if I had the visual, but uh, it does it does work. Uh, so that will be definitely ready by the time of my talk if it kills me. So, are you using a clone promotion to do that? No, there's no clone promotion. It's it. So the idea is that it doesn't have to re-replicate the. Um, the data sets at all it just uses the local the the local copy as long as there's a common uh, common clone or a common snapshot between the two data sets you can keep replicating onto onto a new clone tree 
from a specific point on the backup from the source GUID. It's very cool. And I don't see a lot of I don't see a lot of tools that are doing anything with this. Maybe some of the some of the platforms do. Um, but it'll be a really nice thing to have in our back pockets because I've been in a million situations where I'm not a hundred percent sure it's safe to roll back and there's too much data to do a full copy of. So keeping the backup in sync with production, what without um you know, without re-replicating and then to create a create a new clone tree on whichever side it forks, it's it's cool. It's it's just it's really cool. I mean, for compliance situations, this this means that I have an automated way to guarantee with no work, with dash dash rotate, um, that no data is lost, not on the not on the source part of the source data set or the backup data set, with no additional data wasted because it's not you know because it's not promoting it's not uh it's not taking it's not taking the um uh and it's not taking a full so does that make any does that make sense to, to everybody i feel like i feel like without a visual it's kind of it's kind of messy um to to describe um but i will i will definitely have visuals in my graphics dot file for a relationship between the different data set pardon me how about writing a dot file in Graphit so that you can have it visualize the um, relationship? I think I can do that with metadata or just naming the the rotated data set something that that's clear that it's that it's part of it. But but do remember that the that when uh, there's a clone from... relationship, there's a, there's a, the origin. Um, there is an origin so there's there's already a way to see that so if, if my utilities now I, I obviously the whole point of my utilities is that you shouldn't have to use my utilities i just it's really a work in progress and i want to put pressure on upstream zfs to add some of these uh functions that's the that's the goal of my talk but i think between met, with metadata and, and the and the name of the data set i think i can I can communicate a, a relationship uh, between them, and then you know maybe you have a mm -hmm. I don't know what you would call it uh, you know a, a clones you'd have a backups folder, a clones folder, and an archive folder or something like that. I have to think about the the right the, what my principles are going to be for that. But yeah, I think a, a cache file for sure, Jan. I think that's that's one way, but I think another way would be with the metadata itself. Uh, and I want to try. It. Isn't uh, the dot file wasn't for uh, meant as a way for the tool to work, but just for the documentation purposes for communicating the the potential future user how the pool is laid out for visualization. Just so right, you yeah. Nice uh, okay. graphs to put in your markdown or whatever as uh, not as the way. Uh, to uh, then parse the graphics file at runtime and use it at, as your graph uh, representation, but you know, that would make sense. So, Jan, or what you're saying is you want to go into business to compete with IX systems with me? Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> no. I mean, I think the thing is, at this point, I've been I've been steeped in this stuff so long. I feel like I could do it, but do I really want to raise ten million dollars of VC money and then be you know, have to do that for the re every single day for the rest of my uh, the next ten years. Probably not. Um, yeah. So um, I get tired of uh, explaining to people why <laughs> uh, why a uh, RAID five of twenty terabyte drive isn't the best thing uh, since uh, cut bread. <laughs> but I can. Why first drives are so expensive? I don't want to lose more than one. Hey, I yeah. only bought five drives. Can I put in a sixth because it's full? <laughs> so yeah. yeah, support nightmares. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, because boy. you're not allowed to say uh, things like, sorry, uh, that's a human problem, <laughs> not a technical right. problem. So I see a question in the um yes uh in the in the notes who wants to read that uh 
Oh, I'm sorry. That's me. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we have a, an application that has sort of organically um, grown and shifted to the cloud. And the team that supports it kind of just spins up new AWS instances and um, they're using uh, ZFS and and the approach they've taken so far is a Z pool per customer. So there's a separate, like, um, I forget what those drives are called, EBS block device or something like that. Network block storage crap. Something, yeah, something like that. Um, so in, in AWS, they each get their own device. And then, you know, there's, there's one device per customer. Um, I'm kind of, I, I don't know a lot about that particular area but to me it seems awkward and inefficient to be using so many z pools and i'm wondering whether whether it'll be safer uh using data sets inside a single z pool um i, I know there would be a lot less administration because uh, we could we wouldn't have to resize the z pools so often and we could just create a Z pool large enough and, and set quotas and things like that. But I'm wondering if, if anybody has thoughts about that type of problem and whether there's anything I should watch out for. ZFS allows a little fiddly in my experience, but it does, it works pretty well. Um, <clears throat> are you giving, are you giving people direct access to the, to, to manage their pools? I mean, their, their data sets. No, that would this be is the, no, the, the, this is strictly to serve an application. The application controls all the access. Um, what are you... Oh, I... Sorry. Go ahead, Jan. I was just going to say, I, yeah, I don't, I don't see any problem with this at all. So, sounds um, like a good idea. Sounds like a good idea until... Uh, the question is, how, which guarantees do you have to give about data retention and data destruction so that you can securely delete stuff? Uh, to customers, what level of isolation do you need between the different tenants? And the other thing is that ZFS is only a, or only, it's not a shared cluster file system. Uh, so that means that only because the EBS you're consuming from your cloud provider is a network block storage device, which means you can only mount that at one system at a time. So it, that, which basically means you can have only one virtual machine attached to your block device at a time. Um, so if you want to scale out, you have to have multiple pools. Are all of these uh, pools uh, attached as different EBS devices to the same virtual machine? Yes. Okay, then yeah. it doesn't and, and make I a lot of sense. Any... I don't have any needs to share the EBS across. Uh, uh, there's no need to share the pool across multiple instances. The next question is, if I remember correctly, but don't quote me on that, is that the IOPS scale with capacity? So you could gain something uh, by having one big volume until you reach the scaling limits of the backend because then you can basically over provision your IOPS just like they are doing with you. You can do with your customers now then and have all of the IOPS and proof of a big dev uh, block device uh, to uh, hand out to whoever needs them right now instead of having the throttling applied per uh, device. Of course, if you have to isolate tenants from noisy neighbors, then that can be better to have multiple devices. From an administrative purpose uh, and so on, it would be a bit nicer to have uh, fewer um, pools. The real problem is that ZFS, while you can grow a pool, but uh, there is a cost to doing that because a bunch of data structures are laid out at basically pool time or, or uh, device creation. And so if you start off with a very small uh, virtual block device and then 
growth rate by several orders of magnitude over time, uh, what happens is that the pool isn't laid out well because you have lots of tiny allocation groups because the, for example, per device, the number of uh, allocation groups is decided uh, indirectly by the file, uh, sorry, by the device size. So if you then grow the de same device, you get more groups of the same size instead of larger ones. So you have a more overhead, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that's a lot of that's but, AWS magic, right? Like we no, don't we don't know what uh, like we we don't know how AWS is is mangling those bits on the on its back end. We don't, um, and still you can use CFS send and receive to split things up. And if you are in the tens or hundreds of gigabytes within reasonable time frames. So, I would so one, say, one, go ahead. Do, the other question is why, are, if you're using ZF and so, and so on, why are you paying the obscene prices for such low performance? Uh, with EBS, wouldn't it be better to get some truly local storage and Compliance, then replicate uh, to colder storage? Compliance and scalability, you know. You got to do it sometimes. I I have to sometimes. You know, uh, it, it's a corporate constraint. Um, yeah. We we're not allowed to technically choose other things, so we are constrained to AWS. On what this. I meant is, even AWS has different options when it comes to block storage. Mm -hmm. You can also have node local storage, uh, where you would basically have a lot more IOPS because it's not network attached. Right. So, uh, I'll have to check with the team and see exactly what the devices but, are. I'm, I'm guessing right now, so we might be down a rabbit hole that they're not actually. If you're in the double digit uh, gigabytes, it's so small that maybe that just, it's not worth the hassle to make their life harder to reduce the operational costs and they are just accepting the cost as a cost of doing business. And maybe your application is worth that uh, Amazon tax. Um, it, I can't decide that for you. Oh yeah, right. For me, um, I'm less concerned about operational expenses. Um, I'm more concerned about um, making things easy to administer and uh, reducing the risks of administration. Um, the application is not IO heavy. Um, so a lot of these things, I, I don't have to pay too much attention to, you know, IOPS and also the cost of the, of the IOPS and the storage, but I will get more information on the, the type of storage they're using. And if it's uh, fast enough and not too expensive, um... Yeah, make sure it's easy to use correctly and that you have not just uh, backups, but up-to-date backups, which brings up us back to Daniel. So for example, that you uh, are just basically running a replication in a loop so that you do asynchronous replication of your storage so that you can't just do a uh, roll back to the last night or something. Uh, but roll back to a few minutes ago when something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. hey, you're in a pretty great setup that you, <laughs> this is going to be very easy to back up and stuff. So right. they, they, like a... they have that covered. That was yeah. Um, actually, yeah, they, they have that covered and they're using the ZFS features and they feel pretty good about that uh, as far as like, uh, snapshots and then uh, replicating off to you know different locations. So um, I'm not too concerned about that one. I, I guess I was mostly thinking um, that thing that you mentioned about resizing Z pools is relevant uh, because I think some members of the team stretch a little too far for um, trying to save dollars and so they'll incrementally increase these z pool sizes 
um, over and over. Um, and uh, that, so yeah, but that's if you said, things... go ahead. You said you're not suffering from IOPS though. So I think, I think that's the right approach, especially for cloud. Cause like you can so easily make a thousand dollar a month mistake and stuff. So I think, I think in, in, in your circumstances, I don't see it. Like if you do one big pool rather than 15 little pools and then bump it up when you have to, like, it's not, it's not awesome, but if you're bumping it up by, you know, by many tens of gigabytes every time, I don't think, I don't think your performance is going to suffer so much. The next question would be, can you, um, do you have to pay for the full provision capacity or can you basically yes. get a block storage that is intentionally thinly provisioned and only pay for the uh, materialized capacity? I'm not aware of an ability to do a, a thinly provisioned. Um, we pay for the entire thing right up front. Uh, which yeah. operating system That's are my you experience using? With AWS. I'm sorry, Jan, what was Which the Which operating system are you using? Um, it's it's probably a Debian variant, okay. would be my guess. Yeah. Because uh, on FreeBSD, you would have the option of doing it yourself by putting something like Geom Virtual Storage underneath so that you right. can then plug new block devices into your beneath, underneath the ZFS, but do you want to help? <laughs> or the other actually... option would be to just... Uh, add new block devices uh, to your existing pool so that you have a striped pool. Right. Oh, wait, you have even more options, but I don't know the performance uh, uh, implications of that. You could just um, add a larger device and then remove the old one because you can remove single disks and mirrors from a pool, but I don't know. Uh, uh, that makes it better or worse than growing the single device because there's also a cost to removing a device which has data allocated on it. I don't know, if, but that would be another option. Yeah, that, yes, that's an interesting thought. I, I wasn't thinking about that. Um, and okay. The most extreme option would be to create a new bigger pool and do a ZFS send receive. Yes. But that's probably uh, what, not what you want to do. Well, I, it, I was thinking that's what I was going to recommend. Um, and I still might recommend because I am concerned. Uh, like, So you're saying that if I increase the pool size incrementally, I create this weird, inefficient uh, pool metadata structure. Yes and no. Uh, what I know what happens is that each uh, VDEV gets allocated a certain number of allocation groups and so on. Uh, we have a minimum size, we have a maximum size, but for the realistic range, they scale with device size so that you do not have to cache too many of those uh, allocation groups. Uh, but the size of an allocation group is a uh, fixed uh, VDEV property and that cannot uh, be grown. So when you grow a VDEV, you just get more allocation groups of the same size. So if you start out with a tiny one gigabyte pool and then double that a few times until you're at 128, you still have these tiny little groups, ju just that now you do not have 200, but uh, 200,000 of them. <laughs> Right. Yeah, but is this going to be this going to be a problem if he's starting with five hundred and then going to a T and stuff? I don't think it's going to be a big deal. No, well, we, a few doublings we, aren't a problem. But if you in a in the cloud, you can easily start with a tiny one, and suddenly it becomes your biggest customer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. And if you start with something like one gigabyte, and then I'm so sure you have so... by a factor thousand. Yeah, we would never start at one gigabyte. It's typically something like I started at 30 gigs and I'm going to resize by five gigs or 10 gigs. Like those and also the worst, 
the worst case scenario is that you is is that you make another one that's bigger and do a send send and receive yeah. once a year once a year or something. So right. or and, you know in thing, two years. So yeah, I don't think you have to worry at all. Okay. Well, that's good to know. That's good to hear that like okay, these resizing things that they're doing aren't really dangerous. Uh, that's not that was no, dangerous. It's not but... awesome. It's just yeah, it's not awesome, but it's fine. It's totally fine. But I am Maybe thinking a bit having... of performance, but you're already on uh, EBS storage, so uh... <laughs> right. So I am thinking of of having them say take one of these instances, create a large pool, and move say the the 11 or 12 or 15 customers or whatever into data sets on the large pool and just having them um get that experience to see if that works better as far as administering um those customers and yeah, I, might, I, might discussion, I might push for that yeah, other advantages that I think you could get away with a smaller um, with a smaller spare capacity uh, which you get built for because you can then um, average out the growth among all the customers sharing the pool. So right. if you have one erratic customer, it would be basically averaged out by the full pool capacity so that you can still need the same absolute amount of uh, growth potential for that customer who happens to throw uh, occasional big bursts of rights at you. Um, but that would be then in relation to the whole pool capacity and not the, to that customer's pool capacity. Mm -hmm. I so do you, have another, oh, there's a second part to this. Um, uh, and I, I don't want to take up all the time of the meeting, but I do have an, another question that you guys might be able to help me with. Um, and it has to do with, there are, we have a, a different application that stores a lot of documents. And so if, if I'm a customer and I've been with us for 10 years, I might have, I might have um, 200 gigs of documents that I absolutely want to keep them, but I'll probably never reference them. But I'll have, a, at the very end of that, I'll have a few documents, like, you know, two gigs uh, of documents that are relevant in the current time. You know, so there's like a fresh set of documents that are important to be able to retrieve quickly. And then there's these older things that are just hanging around and um, I'm wondering if it's worth bothering with trying to put the older stuff in cold storage of some type, or if there's a like an industry standard approach to this problem. My question to you would be, what is it that accesses that those documents? Do you need them to be in a completely normal POSIX file system or do you just have to have a command which can write them to standard output by uh, ID or what do you need? Uh... I do not need a POSIX file system. Um, the application uh, insulates the user from the storage of the document. So for instance, they could just be stored in a database. A database um, is probably a lot more expensive than a file system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just trying to pick a clarify bite. that there's, yeah, so, there's uh, no need for a file system. What would be interesting is to basically, uh, even if you just want to have them available, you could move them over to a different data set uh, and then mess around with special location classes and record sizes. So you could have a, a data set for the active part with different settings, maybe on a different pool, depends on what you have available. And then you could just have a directory with a sim link. And you, if you know when the file gets modified and locking is not a problem, you could just 
move it over to a pool with 16 megabyte record size, ZSTD compression on the cheapest reliable enough storage you have. Mm -hmm. And you do that. I don't know if you have a database where you can just query the database to know when the file was last accessed or last modified. And you can then use that to move everything which hasn't been accessed in a while over as a low priority background job. Sure, that could save you a lot of uh, cost and make it feasible to have the parts people regularly access uh, around and fast. If you then can extract the preview or something and keep that on a faster storage, users may never know. Right. Yeah, it's sometimes surprising what you can get with just increasing the record size and the compression level in Notcher 2. And um, writing it, it makes out. A, sorry. Yeah, that's a big difference. And or writing it out quickly so that you actually take full advantage of the large record size and compression. Because when things slowly triple uh, trip in, sorry, so when things slowly trickle in, like they do when someone uploads a uh, uh, document through a web browser of a slow network connection and the pool isn't completely idle it's quite likely that the data has already been uh, partly written before you get to a 16 megabyte uh, block to then really nicely compress down because right. the larger your blocks the more data you have to potentially find redundancies between to then compress down so bigger blocks give you a higher compression ratio but also a higher write latency even in the best case i i guess the sort of the um the abstract thing behind my question is i have a a, a pool or a data set and i have this huge block of data that's mostly static and i just you know, part of me just wants to leave it alone because it's not causing me any trouble. Like as a developer, I'm like, I don't care. I don't care about like minor expenses, let's say. I care about complexity. Um, but I don't know. There's just something about it that it, it feels like we we spend a lot of time shuffling that data around when we're trying to copy data sets or things like that. And so it so I don't care about it, but then it bites me, you know? So that was, uh, that's kind of the situation um, I have going on. Are you familiar with non-ZFS based backup tools like Rustic? Oh, I have, uh, I have looked into that a little bit, yeah. Uh, because they have the same problem you are describing just 10 times worse and they have a solution for that in the data structure, which is that they chunk the data and then compress down the chunks, encrypt and deduplicate them. Uh, so uh, they first deduplicate, then encrypt. Uh, and then all of these little objects are in what they call bundle files so that you don't have lots of small files because if you're having problem shuffling data around and it slows down and you're not getting good sequential IO performance during bulk data move operations, it's quite likely that you have lots of and either small files or uh, fragmented files or files written in very small block sizes at least. So if you could sometimes just put them into a tarball and move the tarball around. The problem with tar, of course, is that it's the worst uh, archive format you can imagine for uh, random reads because all the headers are... <laughs> interleave with the data, but there are other archive formats where you have the catalog split off from the concatenated file content. So if you have lots of small files in the, let's say, less than 10 megabyte range, that could be worth it as an optimization to basically do what BitTorrent does for a multi-file torrent, where you have an index and then a big file with just the offset of a certain object because then you have this big several at least megabyte up into the reasonable number of gigabytes file with all of the little objects just an offset and if you copy that around it's a big file but 
that's a very uh, heavy-handed optimization for uh, bulk copies and random reads at the cost of ever modifying single files. Oh, welcome back, Daniel. Well, we moved over to how can you implement cold storage um, uh, for smallish files and if it's maybe worth to put them into an archive. Yeah, I was I was curious. Are there are there applications that'll that'll like create like cache files and then store on, like you know, like Glacier, Wasabi, or other S three sort storage? Because um, I was looking into doing like figuring out how to do that myself, but there's got to be stuff out there that already does that for ZFS. Not for ZFS, but as I mentioned, while you had to drop off, uh, Rustic does that. It's a backup tool which targets the less fortunate ones who can't offload everything to. Uh... So, um, yeah, it would be neat to have that plus the incrementals, like you know, hourly incrementals with ZFS, and then you could, mm -hmm. you know, then you could have a wide variety of storage types. I mean, I'm, but... I'm sure you could pipe pipe the incrementals into Rustic and do it like that, but. For uh, um, Steve Steele's case, I think it put, makes sense because it's, it's talking about seldom access documents to put them into an object store instead of into a file system. Right, uh, right. Especially when you're in the cloud, because then you can make that someone else's problem. It's not like block storage is so much cheaper to rent than object storage. Right. You've definitely given me something to think about on this um, large document, uh, static document stuff. So mm -hmm. appreciate the help. So especially once you've put it behind a object storage API, you can then decide how to implement that, but you have a clean abstraction and it's not like um, op object storage can't be fast enough for the hot stuff, even if it's backed by CFS. But if you have an object access protocol, it can easily tell you if you are moving objects uh, while they're accessed, you can just say, yeah, sorry, um, dear protocol uh, compliant client, please uh, follow with redirect to the new location for this resource. something you can't do transparently on a file system. At least not with our special purpose virtual file systems you would have to implement yourself. Yeah, NextCloud fakes it pretty well. So you can stick, stick an S3 quote unquote share and sort of drag and drop your stuff. Sure, you can do yeah. similarly crazy stuff with GNOME applications if they really, really use the GNOME virtual file system API for all file accesses until sure. they have some dependency which uses a normal POSIX uh, file I.O. and then everything explodes or you have to have a fuse mount point to have a path where it can materialize its API by doing a redirect through the kernel and back into user space. Yeah. So. Um, and now I, the topic, uh, if you don't have any more questions. Uh, I do not. Because okay. I've been messing around with ZFS block cloning. Oh, uh, nice. How's it going? I've been so far, to... uh, it works for me. I've, uh, my, the use case I'm experimenting with is the following. Um, 
I want to use it for um, effect where equivalent of rebasable ZFS clones. So let's say I want to uh, provision, thinly provision a jail uh, on FreeBSD. And normally you would have to get clever with ZFS snapshot and clone and make sure that your clones never contain data because anything you put into a writable clone is trapped there and you can't rebase it. That's the usual stuff where people find out that ZFS has snapshots and clones and then dig themselves a deep hole of technical depth and can never find their way out because there is no way out. And they should have read the uh, documentation chapter before they started instead of just reading half of the chapter and trying. So, um, then they're done that. So, <laughs> so um, now the idea is if we use a uh, traditional um, DDoP, it's the same thing, just that it takes longer to dig your hole, but you can dig even deeper. So, um, but with ZFS block cloning, you, we can basically do a CP-A, which then does an open for reading, open for writing, copy file range for the full content and gives you a perfect data at the beginning. Well, then most files are read only on a operating system installation, but if you update, you can just do a new CP-A uh, from your updated template to your updated instance of the template, and you maintain uh, an updatable deduplication without the full cost of uh, data set level deduplication because the deduplication is completely opt-in. And yeah, so far I can take a big fat FreeBSD 14.0 uh, user land, which is decompressed about 3.5 gigabytes and copy that on a cheap SATA SSD in a second. Uh, when I use zpool io start to watch how much data gets actually written, I will see a short burst of about two seconds, which uh, over those two seconds writes in total less than 60 megabytes. And no ongoing activity. So the deduplication works and it basically just creates the 40,000 files and fills them with deduplicated content. And I, so I can essentially create a cloned block user land in a second. That's pretty cool. And the nice thing is that you can mix and match at the file level. Right, so you write over a clone and it's just no. regular file now, right? Exactly, it's copy on write. So as yeah. either file gets modified, it drops its reference to the old content, uh, allocates its own new content, and you per block start to diverge. Really nice. And it doesn't, and, and file boundaries don't actually matter. So I could do it with a VM also, or uh, actually, never mind. I just use a regular clone for that. You maybe you wouldn't if you want to punch holes into it again. The only problem is that it, to punch holes back when you have lost the deduplication, uh, you have to make sure that no one else is uh, observes you uh, or interferes with your big copy file range system call. Because what could happen is you request a big big copy file range and someone else modifies the file while you're doing that then you get data corruption because we don't have a system call to do a, I would like you to, to deduplicate, but verify that it's correct at the time. So basically a system call, which tells the kernel that here is the data and here's another file. I, I claim these two ranges are identical if they are deduplicated them or tell me how much you could deduplicate. So instead of a copy, but basically a, a strong hint to please 
could you please deduplicate a system call which is atomic inside the kernel uh, does not exist as far as I know, at least not in FreeBSD. It may, but not on ZFS, exist in Linux as a system call, but it's, I think, only implemented for stuff nobody really uses. So it's not used by anything I have been able to find. Yeah. So it may be possible to get that. Um, and most of the time is really just spent uh, doing tons and tons of system calls because you have to open every file, uh, create every directory, and then with a single system call, uh, perform the copy file range as one system call. The problem is that you can't do them uh, in batches or something like this. I looked into it, you, it would be really neat if we could do that with a ZFS channel program so that you don't have to cross the uh, kernel user space boundary with system calls all the time for tiny operations. And instead could either send a big batch or uh, even do the equivalent of CP-A uh, with a channel program. But it looks like the um, Lua API, which is accessible inside the kernel, is not um, able to access the data set content. You can only do data and pool level operations, not uh, so data set and pool level operations, not uh, file level operations. So that's uh, the bottleneck right now. And you would have to write a clever find invocation to uh, after an update, basically to uh, find their identical files and punch uh, them back in or uh, to do the whole update using that. Find the files which have, mod have been changed uh, between the old template and the new template and which are equal to the old template in the uh, VM. So that basically find all files which were, which are unmodified in the instance of the template. And then all of those which get modified, which are in the union between these two sets, you could probably really do it with a find. So, yeah. So I've got to get out of here, but uh, Joe's brought up a topic that I think would be uh, interesting to talk about. Um, like, uh, so IX systems, which we, which I guess we talked about at the beginning of the call too. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I was, uh, I, I had an overlap and so I, I couldn't really listen in at the beginning, um, but I- No, but we didn't, we didn't get into detail. I mean, I, I mean, I guess I was, I was just wondering, like, I don't know, have has anybody used the Linux version of the IX systems? Uh, what is it, uh, TrueNAS scale, I guess? Yeah, um, my employer is Oracle, so I'm reluctant to uh, to do that. Um, just, I feel weird about it. Uh, but, so I use Illumos and Solaris and FreeBSD ZFS, but, I've, I've never tried it on Linux. Right. And I've heard some stuff about the kernel cache not being, um, some of the kernel caches is not accessible to the ZFS code uh, because of the GPL, uh, CDDL concerns. But right. I don't know if that's true or if I'm just listening to FUD and should stop that or, or uh, what. If I understand that limitation correctly, it's the same or very similar to what it is on uh, 
on FreeBSD that uh, the kernel uh, VMs subsystem, which could use something like, for example, on FreeBSD, a UFS uh, file content to directly be the backing storage for the virtual memory. Uh, you can't do that on ZFS because of compression and uh, copy on write. So, oh, okay. And the issue there is that the ZFS arc can end up in a pathological uh, fight with the normal file system buffer cache if you use both at the same time. So if you have, let's say, an XFS or X4 file system you're using and ZFS and didn't put limits on bo both cache sizes, they could end up basically evicting each other uh, periodically. Because... At one cache grows and then the other says, hey, um, and because ZFS is well written, it would most of the time lose that fight because it would just say, yeah, okay, there's memory pressure, let's shrink. So that you have to make to sure that you don't have multiple uh, users of your kernel memory fighting with each other and then creating memory pressure, backing off, and then trashing the cache again. Does anyone know if that is a concern for the Illumo CFS? I could um, imagine either It's mostly being a concern the case. when you are not using CFS for everything. Okay. Uh, because if all of your data intensive file systems are CFS, it's not much of an issue that the normal buffer cache uh, fights with you. Yeah, on a dedicated ZFS file server, isn't it's... exactly the same either. Hmm? That's that's exactly my question. Is really uh, if they're if their ZFS tree and their uh, VFS stuff is different enough that that like I... they just threw out everything that wasn't the ZFS file system caching or or what? But um... I I put my money on that because it came. It came similar because because FreeBSD merged with OpenZFS, but almost never did exactly. So they're nope. so they work with a they work with a parallel upstream, but not the exact same upstream as the Linux one. So it's probably more like the FreeBSD one than the than the Linux one. So, um, but still still different enough that it throws errors with my script mm -hmm. when I test on Illumo. <laughs> But what is it that's totally. I, I don't know. I, you know what? I'm going to bring this up at the next uh, Open DFS call because I'm because I I'm starting to really like Illumos because it's because I, I was a sun I was a sun guy before I was a Linux guy and before I was a FreeBSD guy. So uh, I was getting getting back into it. Um, I want to do a basically a VM uh beehive and beehive and zones uh with a with a backup of free bsd beehive and jails and uh try to make a you know a totally sort of diverse um like a, a super diverse fleet with uh with with those two operating systems like have this dream um i, I feel so you, yeah there's I have, a, some, I have that on my desk right now is is I've got a Mac, Linux, uh, uh, so, uh, Illumos, Open Indiana, and a, a FreeBSD on my desk, and it's the weirdest. I feel like teenage me would just be ecstatic with the person <laughs> I've I've grown into. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, I just have I just have Illumos and VMs, but I'm enjoying it. So it might be time to to throw my first Rust buckets up in a data center soon. Uh, Daniel, as far as um, Illumos ZFS appliances, there is a commercial uh, Nexenta ZFS appliance. Uh, to my knowledge, it is not freely available. So, do you have experience with it? None, literally none. Hmm. Yeah, you you want to stay away from Nexenta. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, well, we got lots of horror stories. They're actually they're bought by uh, uh, DDN, the uh, storage company. If you recall them, they re they had the uh, InfiniBand solution about a decade ago. But um, I I 
I bought Nixenta, or I shouldn't say I bought my my uh, boss bought it, and I had to manage it, and it, it was a horror show for a couple years. So I have a really stained opinion about them, but I was one of their first big customers too. Um, we bought uh, six petabytes of storage and put it under an Exenta and it was used in the LMOs as their OS. But um, I basically ended up sleeping at the office for about four days after we migrated oh, no. over and the file system failed. And, and it was oh, an no. Exenta issue, it wasn't a ZFS one. Wow. But anyway, well, your mileage may there's vary. Definitely, there's definitely an opening for a new appliance. <laughs> For sure, I think this is the time. And, and uh, I've been dealing with a lot of clients that uh, you know that uh, have have all Datto boxes and stuff. And that that product is monstrously expensive. There's there's definitely space for lots of competitors right now, especially with um, you know with IX uh, you know changing gears in such a big way. Um, yeah. Anyway, we'll see what we'll see what happens. I sadly have to go get tacos, or else I talk about ZFS for the rest of the day. Is there a, um, is there any article about this IX um, change, or is it sort of just known about in the community? It's pretty big news. So they've been switching over to TrueNAS scale for a couple of years now. So I mean, it might be it might be fine for all I know. Like, so, but uh, it just seems like it's it's just seems like a strange. Uh, it seems like a big gear shift for a company that used to be a free BSD shop. So it's not they, a Linux shop, and now it's becoming one. They have so. uh, the problem is they don't just want to. Uh, my reading is they don't just want to be a, a a local file server company, basically. But they want to offer both container and virtual machine uh, runtimes on top of their product, and they want to su um, support something like Ceph, some kind of replicated cluster storage. And yeah, and it's the same as same as half same of as these uh, resistance. Yeah, same uh, as the Datto model. So, and it, they'll make a billion dollars. So, probably <laughs> probably makes sense for everybody but uh, us. So, uh, I dropped a link to the the register article. Um, it is still rumor, but uh, Liam Proven has written an article saying that that uh, IX systems will not be moving beyond free uh, FreeBSD thirteen um, as the underlying system. So right, the old the old news was fourteen or fourteen or fifteen. So I think this is a, this is a this is some big news. Yeah, this is this is from two days ago. So, uh, and I yeah. So interesting. I don't disagree because I see lots of people who are like, uh, I don't. I don't need Docker running on my NAS. I need my NAS to do SIFs and and NFS and maybe some web dev. Give, right. give me give me Active Directory integration and uh, you know the ability to do backups uh, to offsite and just don't break. Seems. Yep. Seems like that's what I would want my product to do, but I can totally see why the features would draw them this way. The problem with doing what you're describing is that you are not promising your investors infinite growth. I I don't like so you know Sorry, that it's... is one of the reasons I am salaried at at Oracle as opposed to in in startups these days because I don't like those promises anymore yep but okay that's my read so basically what i su suspect but can't prove in any way 
happened is that IX system wanted to uh, get a Ceph based cluster storage solution out. And then to do that, they had to port over the whole uh, control plane. And once I had that going, it's, oh, it's CFS. So yeah, it works the same on the next. Why are we keeping it to operating systems? What doesn't have a, because they're not really using the FreeBSD specific things well. They really failed at taking, at commoditizing jails mm -hmm. because the jail uh, templating uh, has always been, yeah, we have like these dozen or so applications. We ported them once, but we didn't think ahead. So we came up with a custom jail manager. First it was the warden, then um, IO page. Both of them died off. One because they start, stopped developing it themselves and then moved to the other one. And then that one was essentially discontinued. Not that it doesn't work, but what we're not doing is maintaining a, basically an app store like interface to, for users where you can get up to date versions of the, all of the things which are available as FreeBSD ports. So something like an up to date version of Nextcloud or whatever which people may want to have on their home server or NAS servers that, because they use it mostly as storage. Uh, so yeah, that's where you get it to the gray uh, corner cases. So, <laughs> and I think another one is that a lot of users have been asking for why can't I run my Docker stuff and they don't have a good enough Beehive integration that they could just say, uh, hey, uh, just run Linux in Beehive and then run Docker or Kubernetes or whatever and on that. And it would have a noticeable performance overhead even if I did everything right. So it may be just the path of least resistance which makes even in both uh, business and uh, technical sense of them. Why I'm a bit salty about it is that until a few months ago, they promised that no, there are no plans and now they have uh, all of the plans suddenly ready and are about to execute. And that in no a shape or form uh, looks like so, an overnight, overnight decision they just decision. came up with. But that's the world of vendor screwing the users over, the users over. And Joseph, in case you're wondering, you can Thank check you. the um, FreeBSD security um, page to see the support uh, life cycle of the cycle. releases. Also, um, uh, yeah. 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 the expiration date for TrueNAS is January 31 of uh, 2026, because that's when the um, 13.x release branch is scheduled for end of life. End of life. I guess we shall see. Do we have any other topics to discuss today? today?
test. The audio is still working. Bye. So, Steve, uh, any more questions about questions? So the last thing is that most of uh, the TrueNet is available uh, open source only a very little, a very little part of it is. A very small part of it is, uh, is truly uh, lonely, so you can just build it from first and and get their patches for SMB, for SMB. Uh, that you can figure out how they join the domain successfully or something like that. Because Samba is completely underdocumented. Under uh, question is: Does anyone pick up those pieces and? Build a, maybe a community product with an intentionally limited scope. scope. Andrenek, you want to do your the honors and honors? Yes, dear. It will be continuing or adjourning. Adjourning, I would say we've spent long enough. Okay. Yes, you have a topic. Well, just running today. Just run. I'll be coming with questions next week. Next. Uh, but I at least wouldn't worry too much about the state of Open ZFS because I systems I wasn't the biggest contributor by far to Open ZFS. It's Who just... is the biggest Wasn't I X system? So them moving to, uh, to uh, Linux does not threaten the viability Linux. of ZFS on ZFS. Well, the viability uh, of C Open ZFS at all. Okay, well, I'm okay. going to say, uh, 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 what's that, 20? 20, 20. One, one, yes. Twenty one, one, three, three, mm -hmm. UTC. This is what makes us closing our call so, today. Thank you all, thank everyone. You all, everyone. Uh, what do we say at the end of the videos? Like and subscribe.